Hey, it's Mr. Veve, and this lesson is on natural selection. So let's get right into it with our first key concept. Populations, not individuals, evolve through the process of natural selection. So we're talking entire populations, groups of the same species, not just individuals. So you're not going to see the process of evolution take place within one individual's lifetime. It happens over many generations within a population. So let's talk about what natural selection is. Let's remind ourselves. It's survival of the fittest. It's a process by which individuals that are better suited to their environment survive and reproduce. So who is the fittest in this case? So in evolutionary terms, we say fitness is the organism's ability to reproduce better than others. So basically, whoever survives and has the most offspring is the most fit. So that may be because that organism has a trait that is better suited to its environment and its survival and that one actually survives a little bit longer and has more of a chance to reproduce and pass those genetic traits on to its offspring. So we're going to talk about four different principles here of natural selection. So in order for natural selection to occur, there must be one of these four. First one is genetic variation. So variations are these little differences within a species, and these variations must be passed on through generations to affect natural selection. So we want to see uh, slight variations in how um, these organisms interact with their environment or if they are less fit or more fit to their environment. And these actually we can follow through generations in order to see what is going to be the better fit. The next thing is overproduction of offspring. So many species produce more offspring than can actually survive. And a great example of this is sea turtles. They may lay hundreds and hundreds of eggs maybe only two or three of those eggs uh, turns into an adult sea turtle because either the eggs don't hatch or they don't survive the trip from the, uh, the nest to the ocean or they get eaten before they can actually produce offspring. So if you produce a lot of offspring like these sea turtles do, you'll ensure that at least a few of them survive into adulthood and have their own offspring. So next one is struggle for survival or adaptation. So uh, Offspring have to uh, compete for limited resources. So you think about these uh, offspring within the same population. And sometimes one of the, uh, the offspring will have a certain variation that allows them to survive just a little bit better than their sibling maybe. And so they are more likely to survive because of that adaptation. And therefore they're going to pass that along to the next generation because they will survive long enough to reproduce. And finally we have differential survival and reproduction. What this means is there are organisms within a population that outcompete other organisms, but only some of them will reproduce. So just because uh, an animal within a population survives and can outcompete everybody, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to uh, reproduce and have offspring. So that's the whole uh, idea right here. So now we're going to look at a couple of natural selection examples. We're going to look at camouflage, number one, and we're going to look at mimicry, number two. So first, a great example of camouflage is the peppered moth. So before the Industrial Revolution happened, you had uh, trees in the area that were very grayish looking bark, and you had moths that were black. And this was not a good thing for them. So what happened was um, the moths were trying to become a little bit more um, uh, uh, camouflage, so they would actually... Uh, turn a little bit gray in order to blend in with that bark. So you can see in the left hand side, if you look very, very closely, over time you had the moths that turned gray. So you can see one on the left hand side. The black moths were then eaten because they were not suited for that environment. What happened is during the Industrial Revolution, lots of factories, lots of smoke and ash and soot and stuff being thrown into the atmosphere and it actually turned the, the bark of these trees where these moths lived a very very dark ashy sooty color and so what happened is now those moths that were uh, designed to be camouflaged against the grayish looking part of the uh, bark they were now bright and easily spotted and the darker colored moths were now camouflaged so they were the ones that survived in order uh, to pass on their genes. So this is a great example of how the environment can change and a certain organism is no longer fit to survive. Uh, the next one is about mimicry, and this is just the viceroy versus the monarch butterfly. 
So monarch butterflies, the ones on the right, are, are actually quite poisonous for organisms when they eat them. Uh, and what the viceroy butterfly did, which is not poisonous, is it started um, evolving to look like the monarch butterfly because what happened was organisms would not eat it if it was uh, if it resembled a poisonous butterfly. So that's how it survived long enough by mimicking a poisonous butterfly. So something there that uh, actually helps it survive and uh, survive uh, survive to reproduce and pass that trait on to further generations. So now we're going to look at natural selection in polygenic traits. So anything that is polygenic is uh, controlled by multiple genes. So we know like things like human height are, um, are controlled by multiple genes. So now if we're looking at natural selection with this, there are a few different types of curves that we're going to look at. So um, a normal polygenic trait, if there is no natural selection happening, you will see a normal uh, distribution or a bell curve. So a bell-shaped curve like the one you see on the bottom right. This is if nothing is happening, there's no selective pressure whatsoever. But let's see what happens when something like a directional selection takes place. So directional selection is the, uh, when the entire curve, the entire bell curve, shifts in one direction. So the mean moves from one spot to another spot. Uh, that, that means that one extreme or the other of a, um, of a trait is actually favored. So the individuals at one end of that bell curve are the most fit. So then the new bell curve is shifted over. And the great example here is uh, 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 bacteria and antibiotics. So bacteria that have high drug resistance in certain cases are more favored to survive. So that means you'll see more of them over time. So stabilizing selection is when the uh, genetic variation is decreased because the individuals right there in the middle of the curve are the most fit. So you'll see the edges or the extremes kind of pare down and they're not going to see as many of those. Great example here is in humans, birth mass. So there is a selection against really extreme birth masses, very, very, very low weight babies and very, very, very high weight babies. Uh, the selection for the ones right in the middle is kind of a just right sort of situation and then you get a very tall bell curve where the extremes on each side are sort of selected against. So that's called stabilizing selection. And the last one is called disruptive selection and that is where the individuals at the ends of the curve actually are better suited for the environment than the ones directly in the middle. So you end up getting this uh, curve that has two high points, two peaks, because the ones in the middle are selected against and so you see their numbers go down and you see the ones on the sides their numbers go up because they are selected for. Great example here is birds with um, small, medium and large beaks. Now there's no need for medium beaks in this situation so perhaps only the ones with small and large beaks are selected for because of the different food sources that are available to them. So those are the three different types of selection.